So this morning, uh, the text is going to come from the book of Micah. And I've chosen Micah for two reasons. One, it complements Greg's uh, series on Isaiah. And the second is because one of my favorite people in all the world is named Micah. Now, Micah was a prophet preaching and living in Judea during the reign of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He prophesied sometime between 750 B.C. and 686 B.C. And uh, so, therefore, he was a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, the great political enemy of God's people at that time was Assyria, as we also saw in Isaiah. And Micah predicted the fall of Samaria in chapter 1, verse 6, and then he sees the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, fall in 722 B.C. at the hands of the Assyrians. But the most destructive enemy of God's people was not Assyria. It's the same then as it is now, namely sin. What would bring Judea and Jerusalem to ruin was their sin. And so God sent Micah to call the people to repent and to warn them of coming judgment. Now Micah's message alternates between prophecies or oracles of doom and oracles of hope. Uh, this is kind of in terms of Romans chapter 11, verse 22, and actually chapter 11, the subtitle for that in my Bible is the remnant of Israel. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Uh, this theme is, is um, a divine judgment and deliverance, and the book can divide it into three cycles of prophecies of doom and hope. And we're really not going to go through it um, in those three cycles. We're, I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit. I want to take it in order of, of the sins that Micah has called out uh, that Israel has committed. Uh, now, Micah doesn't waste any time in his prophecy. Right away in the very second verse, we read, Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all of you who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you, the Lord, from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him, and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All of this is because of Jacob's transgressions, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgressions? Is it not Samaria? What is Judea, high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards, I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. Since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, as the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. So there's a lot in these few verses. And like I said earlier, Micah uh, foresees the fall of Samaria, and of course in verse 6 we hear that Samaria fell to the Assyrians. Um, but in verse 5, um, he talks about Jacob's transgressions, and in referring to tr Jacob's transgressions, he's really referring to all of Israel, um, you know, what their sins were. And uh, the first sin that he calls out is idolatry. Um, in verse 7, when he refers to the wages of prostitutes, he's not talking about prostitutes in the term that we would define it today, but he's, he's, it's a, a prostitution was often an Old Testament symbol of idolatry and uh, spiritual unfaithfulness. So Israel had turned from God and began to worshiping idols. 
And then in verse 7 when it says, uh, since she had gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes, and as the wages of prostitutes, they will again be used. Micah is res- referring to the Assyrians who will plunder Samaria and will take those idols and place them in their own temples and worship at idols again. Um, so then we go to chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And uh, here we're looking at where the wealthy and oppressive landowners are trying to steal the land um, and uh, family inheritances. Um, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it is their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud a man of his home and a fellow man of his inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it is, will be a time of calamity. Um, basically, an inheritance in those days was um, land and homes, you know, their home that was meant for a family, and it was to be that family's possession forever. And the wealthy were finding ways to cheat landowners of their inheritance. So we're now looking that um, um, Israel was practicing idolatry. The rich were coveting and stealing their neighbors' homes. Um, Then in verse 3, Micah says, Therefore the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people, from which you cannot save yourselves. You no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In verses 1 and 2 then, um, this is what they're doing. And in verse 3, this is what's going to happen. Disaster, which you cannot save yourselves. Next, we see the prophecy of indictment of Judea's leaders and false prophets. And we're going to go over to chapter 3, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, if one feeds them, they proclaim peace. If he does not, they prepare war to wage war against him. So what does that mean? Well, the church leaders, the prophets and the and the preachers, what they were doing, they were preaching for hire. Um, They would preach peace if you fed them, if you gave them money. And if you didn't, they'd wage war against them. So uh, we've got, now that we're looking at, at the church leaders also, we're looking that Israel was practicing idolatry They were coveting and stealing uh, the inheritance from the poor. And the church leaders were basically preaching for hire. So I'm going to jump one more time to chapter 6. And we're going to look at chapter 6, verses 11 to 13. Shall I acquit a man with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Her rich men are violent. Her people are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you, because of your sins. Um, Another version of this says, Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a deceitful bag of weights? This kind of sounds worse. Uh, than it was in the NIV version. It clearly was an evil day. Um, Micah had the unpopular job of warning people uh, that the corruption of business and commerce in religion and politics was going to bring a terrible judgment from God uh, if there was no repentance. So Israel was worshiping idols. They were coveting and stealing from the poor. The church leaders were selling themselves 
uh, through preaching for hire, and the businessmen were cheating the poor for ill-gotten Ill gains, Israel had turned from God Do some of these sins sound familiar at all? I mean, do we practice idolatry? You look at what they're talking about, idolatry, and, and you, you get the image of a golden calf or something like that. But really, what is idolatry? Um, do we worship our money? Do we worship our homes? Our, uh, our cars, our boats, anything that we put before God is an idol. Do we covet and steal? Do we want something that someone else has so much that we don't want them to have it? <laughs> um, I would say yes. Um, do we have some businessmen that may be just a little heavy on the scales, as he talks about? Yes. Sins from yesterday are still relevant as sins today. But then, in Micah chapter 4, verse 10, Writhe in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon, there you will be rescued, there the Lord will redeem you out of the hands of your enemies. Writhe in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. There's going to be hard times, there's going to be darkness. But at the end of this verse, there's hope there. This is the start of his uh, prophecy of hope. Um, but the Lord will redeem you if you repent. Then Micah gives the deliverance promise. And in, in chapter 2, verse 12, I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob, I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in the pen, like a flock in its pastures. The places will be a throng with people. And then the promise continues in chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 1. And see if this doesn't sound a little bit familiar with what we heard two weeks ago uh, in Isaiah. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's rulers on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me uh, one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel... You will be abandoned until the time when she, wrote, when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flocks in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord God. And they will live securely for, their, for then in his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. Micah gives the prophecy of a Savior coming from Bethlehem, a Savior for the remnant of Israel, for those who repent. Micah speaks of this repentance in chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, and I'm first going to look at the first two verses only. What shall I come before the Lord? Or with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? 
These are all things that were part of the law in the Old Testament, but they were really meaningless you know, to God at this point. The people had turned from him, and he was looking for something more. And what more was he looking for comes from verse 8, which is probably the most quoted verse in the book of Micah. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In this one verse, possibly the most memorable verse in the Old Testament, uh, defining a proper relationship with God, uh, Micah has summarized the major themes found in the prophecies of his near contemporaries. Amos, in Acts, or in Amos um, chapter 5, verse 24, um, to act justly, but lest justice roll on like a river of righteousness, like uh, a never-failing stream. Um, Hosea, to love mercy, uh, chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledge of God, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Again, what he was talking about, why the offerings were not satisfactory to him. And in Isaiah, walking humbly with our God, chapter 29, verse 19. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. In other words, we're to be more Christ-like. In chapter 7, Micah talks about this darkness uh, that will come over Israel. And it starts right away in verse 1, where he says, What misery is mine! In verse 8, um, I'm going to read verses 7 to 9 here first. But for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for my God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and establishes my right, he will bring me out into the light, and I will see his righteousness. In verse 8, when it says, Do not gloat over me, my enemy. He's talking about Assyria. Don't gloat. Um, you are only being used as an instrument of our judgment. Um, though I sit in darkness, Israel's darkness, our darkness, my darkness, is my sin and it's his indignation and his anger but he himself will bring me forth to the light he will be my deliverance it says the Lord will be my light he will be my deliverer the difference between this and cheap grace is that God takes sin so seriously we don't really think about that today um, there is a reprehensible fall then and now. Um, there's a real and terrible indignation and anger from God. There's a time of awful darkness, and I don't know if you feel that sometimes. Uh, there's a brokenness, contrition, and remorse as we bear patiently the judgment of our God. Verse 9, because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and establishes my right. If we lay that sin at his feet and ask him to plead our case, um, if we come to him as, as in verse 8 of chapter 6, or if, yeah, in verse 8 of chapter 6, acting justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with our God, he will deliver us. He will bring me out into the light, and I will see his righteousness. 
as Israel, we need to let God break us and then let him bless us. And that's what salvation is really all about. We need to repent and we need to ask his forgiveness and let him plead our case because we can't. We have no case. We need to ask him for his mercy and then we need to follow him. That's Micah in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Anyone have anything this morning? One more song.